Uh, welcome, Prasadji, once again to this journey dialogues. Uh, welcome. This is thank you part two. Uh, I'm so so grateful. I haven't edited the first dialogue, but I just went through snippets of it, and I I was fascinated by uh, the landscape that you covered in that conversation. You know, right from sharing your semblance of applied wisdom as you began as a child, uh, where you talked about two different kinds of schools that you were exposed to from your grandparents. You know, on one side you had the reflective, contemplative writing as a way of thinking uh, kind of mechanism. And the other, the loving kind, the kind, barter kind, and uh, no boundaries and playful kind. And you got that as an exposure. Even your uh, uh, tryst with pneumonia uh, and, and the interesting anecdote around it. And then you, you wonderfully covered and captured um, the landscape of how uh, in the past, it was about building on the previous knowledge system. Uh, it, was, it was also a systemic approach towards knowledge system in some sense, uh, where uh, one could not just stand up and claim to be an expert, but you would go through a set of uh, commentary, a set of reflection over a period of time, and then get into contestation of ideas or have a certain kind of, you know, uh, mechanisms to have dialogues or, or, or dialogos or uh, Socratic method of exchange. Uh, you wonderfully shared uh, the examples from uh, Adi Shantaracharya and Mandan Mishra. You also covered how it was about uh, places and different places would give birth to different communities of, of learning. So it was not restricted to just the university or the schools, the old schools or gurukuls. It was also the king's palaces or, or, or uh, different, you know, different kind of pursuits. Uh, it was also fascinating to hear the exaptation that you did on the muffin story, the, the, the breakfast muffin thing, uh, how you wonderfully exapted it into a development program for such a huge company. It's, it's, it's a wonderful stuff. Um, so yeah, all in all, it was a fascinating dialogue and it has just put too, much, too many curious questions in my mind and I would invite you to weigh in on some of them. Uh, sure. So the first one, uh, Prasadji, is about, uh, I remember listening to uh, uh, Swami Atma Priyananda, uh, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Ramakrishna uh, Mission, uh, a physicist, IIT and physicist and monk now. And uh, one of these days he was giving a discourse on Swami Vivekananda. And he mentioned that towards the, uh, towards the ending years of Swamiji's life, uh, Vivekananda ji uh, lamented two things such and he, he said that these two he could not find enough in people around and mm -hmm. he cited that these two were Sat Shakti and Sangathan uh, Sat Shakti and uh, uh, Sat Shakti Sat Shakti mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and Sangathan uh, such Shakti, just for the viewers, largely is about your own conviction of the deeper truth that you've churned over a period of time, uh, deeper reality, and you believe in it despite, you know, the whole world opposing it, and you standing for it. And Sangatan is, I think he lamented the fact that something snaps between, even when good people come with good intentions, they come together, something snaps, and the Sangatan doesn't get formed. Uh, I wonder if if you could if you could ref, if you could vein on this or something comes up for the for you on on when you hear this. There are a couple of uh, thoughts that come to my mind. It is like we operate in a certain field, chetra. That's the best way we can describe it. Is field because you mentioned about a physics. You talk about electromagnetic field and you talk about uh, uh, the gravitational field. Or, you know, when you look at any of these kinds of fields, you operate based on the law of the field. You can't just say, I will walk when I'm in ocean, or you can't swim on earth or, uh, you know, try to walk in air. Each of the field requires a certain way of behaving for you to survive, let alone contribute to the field. Majority of us in society, whether it is a 21st century society or some other time, 
we operate in a certain energetic field that we are associated with. That's what we call Sangha. Uh, Sanghat Sanjayate Kama, Kamat Krodo Vijayate, Krodo Bhavati Sammoha, Sammoha Smriti Brahma. It goes, you know, Smriti Brahma Buddhina Sa, Buddhina Sa, Pranasyati. In the Bhagavad Gita second chapter, everything begins with even our desires that we have within us are generated even though we think we are generating those desires within us, they are instigated and stimulated by the association that we are part of. For example, uh, whether it's a Samsung phone or an Android device or an iPhone, you don't suddenly say, I wake up in the morning and say, I want to have an iPhone i15. You saw it somewhere and you saw somebody else around you having it and then that desire actually is something that is awakened through exposure. It is not, even though you own it, you think I want it, I am the one who is asking for it and I have this desire, I am dreaming about it, but where did the dream come from? If you don't know that it exists in the Sangha, in the group that you are associated with, you won't notice it. So, for example, I was, uh, you know, yesterday, myself and my wife and my neighbor, uh, we were talking about a car, a particular car called Hyundai Ionic 5, because uh, my neighbor has been very interested in Tesla. Uh, he wanted to buy a Tesla car. What was amazing was, it was only like two miles to go from our home to the restaurant where we went to eat. Within that two miles distance, we saw approximately 12 or 13 Tesla cars and about four, this Ionic 5, Hyundai Ionic 5, electric cars. If we were not to start the conversation about either of these cars, probably we would have not even noticed any of them. Actually, we didn't even know that that many cars are there. But because we became aware is the right word I can use. When we become aware of something, the whole world shows up as that awareness or not that awareness. So, the idea like the Swamiji mentioned, the two words which you talked about, are connected with what field, what Sangha, what uh, energy that is existing in the circle that you move in will shape and put you into a particular field effect. And that field effect that we normally call is autopilot. And the how does the field act upon? It gives you desires. It gives you beliefs. It validates some of your own uh, beliefs or theories, pet theories. And some things show up as facts. And some facts show up as lies. So, like you probably are familiar with the, fa the famous story which is used in a variety of uh, uh, Vedanta lectures. They talk about uh, a, a gentleman who is a vegetarian, who was a Brahmin. He was, uh, what you call, given a, um, what you, a sheep, I think. Some kind of a sheep was given to him. He didn't know what to do with it. He didn't know how to take care of the sheep, nor he wanted to uh, eat uh, by killing it. So he was going to take it to a market to sell it. So he was carrying that. And some somebody came in and said, ha, 
why are you carrying a dog on your shoulders? He said, hey, are you blind? This is sheep, not dog. He said, oh, whatever you say. And went away. Then another person came. Another person came. Another person came. Some four or five people said the same thing. Why are you carrying a dog? At the end of four or five people saying that it's a dog than a sheep, uh, the gentleman really got confused and said, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I am carrying a dog thinking it's a sheep. Who cares about a street dog? And he left it and immediately those four or five people came and took the sheep and ran away. Maybe my sense is that is how we live in the field. When five people, four people say what you are saying is wrong, we may stop believing in it even if inside us we know that it is truth. So we are operating in a certain hypnotic state. And chances are all of us live 90% of our lives in that hypnotic state. You know, in Vedanta talks about it as a Maya. Uh, and, uh, you know, in psychology, we talk about autopilot state or a hypnotic state. But all our facts, all our experiences, all our learning, all our beliefs are created within that field of Maya. But we think we know, we think we are the best uh, experts on that particular fact and we think we are right and we don't know how to deal with when somebody else says what we have been believing all our life is a lie or it is wrong that is where the conflict start so the two things which swamiji mentioned they are very very important because we are living like to a certain extent at so much below our potential because we don't challenge, we don't take risks, we don't want to go outside our comfort zone. You know, that's another word for autopilot and, you know, uh, uh, a hypnotic state that we live in. And we don't listen to other people saying something which is completely opposite of what we believe in. So at some level, our belief becomes uh, the prison that nobody put us in our prison, but we are in a prison made up of our own beliefs, made up of our own experiences, made up of our own unwillingness to question and inquire deeply into ourselves. So at some level, self-knowledge, self-awareness, self-questioning, self-inquiry, as we call it, becomes extraordinarily necessary for us to break out of it. Because no teacher can penetrate the veil. No teacher can penetrate the maya. The teacher can put a mirror. But if we think that is not me we are seeing in that mirror, no teacher can help. So the role of a teacher is to provoke the inner teacher. Only then we can break out of it. So uh, Vedanta, th this particular Swamiji is uh, really telling essential truths of uh, how we live and what we need to do to break out of it. That's what comes out for me. So there is the there is the aspect of uh, uh, realization of of this. And then there is the path of actualization of the realization in some sense, living, practicing those realizations in daily acts in smaller pieces. Um, there are three, it actually segues well into something that I had thought of that I would ask on this uh, call with you. There are three stories and I'll, qu I'll try to quick quicken them so that you know I don't take up too much of time. Uh, sure. The, the story of Sant Eknath's son-in-law, the mm -hmm. story of Arjuna, and the story of Janak and Ashtabhakra. Uh, now, 
these three stories are slightly different than than the realized. Uh, so the, first, the the piece that you weighed in all, was about you know people who do not realize that this is the case, and yeah. and they are not even on the path of actualization. But these three stories, incidentally, are actually places where people have realized something they were actualizing something and yet they hit a roadblock. So in the case of Sant Eknath, you had his son-in-law uh, who veered away from uh, scriptural uh, learnings that he had had before he got married. And after right. the marriage, he went on to uh, get into uh, certain vasanas of, of, of drinking, of gambling, of sex workers and stuff. And Sant Eknath had to come in and weigh in on, uh, why don't you just just simply, you know, uh, my daughter and my daughter has developed asakti for you. Uh, uh, maybe she doesn't understand scripture. Why don't you every evening before you leave the house, why don't you just give her a, uh, a part, uh, uh, something something to learn, a swadhyaya. And he starts on that journey. He starts uh, reciting Bhagavad Gita for almost a year. And in that journey, whatever he had learned earlier, which he had sort of forgot, he realized that the asakti is not his wife's asakti, his own asakti. And that's what brought certain transformation. So here's a person who had realized one once, was actualizing it and lost his way. And then again had to bring him here. When I look at Arjuna, uh, again, I'm just a very simple student. But what I believe is, uh, here's a case of a warrior who was given huge amount of training and statecraft and uh, a, a lot of, you know, Shastras were also given to Arjuna in some sense. Uh, and yet when he was confronted to this uh, battlefield, he, he, he found himself paralyzed of taking the choice in the action. And finally, Raja Janak, who had exposure of all kinds of Shastra and contestation of ideas, had still had to go to Ashtavakra to uh, find out what is that uh, thing that would give him liberation. So these three stories are stories of realizations and actualizations and paths missed out or something something that tells us that this journey is not that simple. And, you know, uh, what do you feel about when you hear these? When I hear these, I believe each of us have got the spark of divinity, spark of divine consciousness, spark of uh, the Atman, with, you know, Paramatma is part of our Jivatma. But like somebody said, uh, Below the seven chakras in the Kundalini, underneath the coils of the snake in the Muladhara, all our potential to self-actualize and discover our true nature, which is the Paramatma or Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi kind of thing, all are lying within that, underneath that. So first you have to go beyond the fear to break the Muladhara go beyond the instant gratification to go beyond the swadhisthana which is the second chakra near the genitals then you have to go beyond the um, what you might call manipura chakra the idea of greed i want more i want to accumulate i you know i don't want to ever go back to the muladhara state of fear so I will accumulate money. I will accumulate not only for me, but for my children. I don't want to go through the poverty and I don't want my children to go through the poverty. So now the poverty doesn't exist in the body level. It exists at the mind level. So the greed is about actually fulfilling the emptiness of the mind or the need of the mind, the fear of the mind to be done. That is where you go through the Manipura. That's uh, literally, then comes the fourth level, which we have next set of barriers, which we have to deal with, where you experience the love, but it is not the good part of love that connects, but it is the attachment to that love. Like Eknath, 
story which you mentioned about you know um, about uh, various things whether it is a drink or whether it is the uh, sex workers or any of them or for arjuna mamaka pandavas chaya the, all these people when uh, you know even dhritarashtra asking my sons versus panduputras you know he mine versus others or uh, pandava saying my teachers my uncles my brothers my kids my teachers all of them why do i need to fight he suddenly remembers ahimsa in the middle of it and forgets that the role that he came to play is not a relative role but to fulfill dharma he has a certain kshatriya role but in that role there are no relatives there are no some this one either i am following the dharma and fulfilling my responsibility or commitment or not that uh, confusion that comes up is the one that generates attachment to knowledge or attachment to people so the love becomes misused in some other way at the heart level then comes the at visuddha throat the true nature of who am i literally it is visuddha suddha suddhikaranam the purification takes place that my cult my group my family beyond that i am unique i am different i have a contribution to make i came as this spark of brahman because there is a particular role that this spark has to fulfill it is about finding my voice finding my unique message that i need to give and i need to receive that purification from dropping out of all the relationships needs to take place at that level then you know uh, by the way that is where the arrogance also comes in literally the arrogance that i know this i am that and here when you look at the agna chakra you have the ability to command the universe to operate according to your agna but there is also i am superior i am this teacher of ramakrishna mission you are you know of this teacher of something else but i know more i know better mine is older my religion is better my teacher was greater or how come you are getting you know you are such a small fly and you are getting all the name and fame and recognition but i deserve more you learnt it from me and nobody respects me the jealousy matsaryam the mada madam the arrogance and matsaryam the jealousy that comes in that creates the world into two it is like a me versus you ultimately i need to recognize i am you until that comes in the agna creates a duality polarity and then you let go of even that then you become like one of the hair there is no distinction between one hair and the other hair yes some of them may be whiter some of them may be blacker but today's blackness may turn out to be tomorrow's grayness but there are thousands of the hair and there is no distinction between one and the other so sahasrara is like the thousand petal lotus there are thousand ways thousand names thousand forms and uh, all of them are equal and all of them are nothing when you become connected with that truth of there is uniqueness but that uniqueness is not in how you differentiate there are unique ways in which the universe expresses like the purusha sukta says you know sahasra you know the whole idea of uh, uh, how everything is thousand it becomes you know that's that's how it uh, starts out sahasra bhumir vishvato rutva atyadishtad dusangula 
the whole universe is uh, thousand names, thousand forms, thousand ways. But it's all one. I think this is the journey. So what I just said to you is for us to break through. You know, this this is where the Arishad Vargas, we have to go through Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Moha, Madha, Matsarya, if you want to call, starting from the fear. This is the journey of development for us to do. But what is interesting is, it is not linear. Okay, I checklist, I'm no longer afraid. Checklist, uh, desire. Checklist, uh, you know, dealing with Lobham. No, no, it is not. Actually, it all starts, as you rightly pointed out, whether it is the three stories which you pointed out, you know, uh, what you call, all of it starts with where I am right now and where we are, where we are born, where we die is in the place of love. It is the heart, anahata, it is right in the middle. So at some level, we start at the fourth chakra and from fourth chakra, you move. So from fourth chakra, you go to third chakra. From there, you go to fifth chakra. From fifth, you come back to second chakra. Then you go to seventh chakra. And then you go back to the first chakra. And then the bhayam goes away. And what remains is abhayam. No fear. That is why when uh, some of the god pictures, if you look at all the murtis, they show this. This is abhayam. Abhayam essentially means there is no longer any fear because there is no duality ultimately. So you go back to Muladhara and integrate with Sahasrara. Because this is not a linear path from Muladhara to Sahasrara. It is actually a sp spiral. It goes on. Starting with love, ending with togetherness. And this journey is the one that breaks the Maya. And, to, and so for Yeknath, it was discovering, you know, a yearly one year journey of, uh, you know, finding the Asakti. Rediscovering it for, along the process, yes. Right, along the process. And uh, for Arjuna uh, to have uh, the Viswarupa Sandarsanam or to a certain extent clarity. But again, it all comes down to choice. Like if you remember in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna asks, I told what I told you. Did your questions get answered? Are you ready? Then he, he, Arjuna has to say, yes, I am ready and I am willing to do. When the choice is made, that has to be made through what is called Swecha, Swa Icha. My own desire is the one that gives me my own freedom, Swatantram. The ability to act in that field is the freedom. And that freedom comes out of my own will. Most people mistake that. They think that it is somewhere else Somebody else is giving it. But it is about discovering it is within me, whether it is God, whether it is teacher, they can only point it out to you. They put a magnifying glass. They, you know, get you to do. But uh, choice of whether I want to be a leader or, you know, like a, whether I'm going to be an order taker or agenda setter, as they call in business world. It is up to me. And whether I want to look at every, now that I have become a leader, whether I want to look at everybody else as a follower and I am the only leader, then that will get you down. Or I look at it and say, now that I am a leader, everybody whom I see is a leader waiting to be. So my job is to awaken the leadership in each one of them because my job is not to teach them something. My job is to wake them up. The awakening, the intelligence within them. If I can do, then I recognize I'm a leader of leaders. It's a privilege to be a leader of leaders rather than it is 
I want to control everybody else because I am a leader and you are nobody. That is the second level of realization. Awareness of awareness. That awareness of awareness or consciousness of consciousness, when it keeps spreading, then you don't have a memory lapse. That's why the knowledge of the past gives you memory. But that knowledge in continuous application following a particular set of dharmas become actually the wisdom. So the wisdom I can have just like Eknath and lose it. But it has to be continually put in practice. So that's why the wisdom is a practice. It is related to living it. And even in the Western thing, they talk about, uh, you know, like the wisdom is the highest state than, you know, care and love and uh, some of these things. Beautiful. So that's what comes up for me. Beautiful, beautiful. Such a beautiful landscape and, and insight. Um, you've been in this, this field... Uh, I remember in one of your talks, you mentioned that in 90s, you uh, you wrote a paper on Trigunas, early 90s. And then for the last almost 30 plus years, you've been on this journey. You must have met a lot of uh, companies, a lot of CEOs, a lot of leaders. Uh, what are the things that you, uh, what are the things that you found uh, are, I don't know whether this is a question, but are there some patterns that you observed when you when you when you look back and see these set of people who are trying to connect with you or you approaching them and trying to help them transform or change? Uh, are there any insights or patterns that you see uh, which are on one side interesting and and really helpful, and some which are very concerning? There are two answers I, I can give. What I notice by myself, for myself, what I noticed is about others that I have observed. Let me start with uh, what I observed. Yes, I did have from 1990, February, I started this journey. So it is about 34 plus years that, that I have been working with. And I had a great fortune to coach over 130 CXOs and probably about 55 to 60,000 people have gone through my talks wow. and workshops and some of them. So that's a huge number I had a chance to interact with. What I find is the questions are the same. Framed differently in different language, in different contexts, different stuff. Answers are again the same. Only thing is, each person discovers it in their own way when they are ready. And some people don't. They keep rejecting the answers. Still, you know, it is like it becomes a cricket bat hitting on the side of the head again and again and again. They won't accept it. And of course, that is the human predicament. So what I see in terms of executive coaching, mentoring, uh, leading programs on transformation, working with people on uh, various corporate or educational, any of them, is no different from human development. Only thing is, it is happening within a certain context, team context, company context. The kind of Boeing is an aircraft company, Ford is a automobile company and uh, Paka is a paper company or something else. State Bank is a financial. So companies change. What they do out there as products and services change. And the knowledge and the background, whether they are engineers, whether it's a production company, whether it's a a pharmaceutical company, whether it's an agricultural company, whether it's a knowledge and cloud company, those also may change. But how do I lead other people? How do I motivate them? How do I inspire them? How do I influence them? How do I control them? 
how do I make them more productive, less productive? Those are the, what you call a, uh, you know, Doug Gingelbart, the gentleman who invented the computer mouse and several of them, he used to say there are A, B, C, three kinds of works. A is what we do for living. That may be 100 different jobs in 100 different industries. But how we prepare to do our job, how we train, how we educate, how we study, what degrees do we get, what certificates you get, the training, learning, education, that is B kind of work. There, there is a lot more commonality. So you have business school, you have medical school, you have engineering school, you have uh, law. These are some things, but out of that, there may be a lot of things that might happen. So that means the entire Silicon Valley industry may come to how to brand something or how to market something or, you know, how to do design thinking. They may all come together. So in B, there is a lot of commonality. But how we apply what we learned there becomes A work in our own job, in our own thing. Then comes the C work. C work is where it is collaborative. It is the, at some level, to a certain extent, if I were to put it in my own words, not in Doug Engelbart's words, I would say that is where co-creation is possible. Who am I? learning this subject in Stanford to apply in this company called Apple or Google or something else, there is one person, you know, we are all human beings, maybe male, female, young, old, from different countries, but uh, human aspirations, human anxieties, human fears, those are the source of all of that. And when we operate from that perspective, it becomes inside out. And there, there are very few things that changed from thousands of years. Only thing is we may talk about hacking the brain or we may talk about uh, learning from Khan Academy in an accelerated form in a video, in a, you know, and uh, personalized robots from, uh, you know, OpenAI uh, the, um, or from Google, some of them might actually do personal tutoring of those subjects. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is like your own, get your own Krishna for you, the Arjuna. Uh, so the, the world has changed in that respect. But what it teaches, how we apply, the fears that we have, haven't changed. So that is one of the major things which I have learned in past 35 years. So that is, so the CEOs, the people, their technology, the speed with which they do, how they change, but the questions have not changed. Then let me look at it from a, my own perspective. What I found is I had become so busy being a teacher, I stopped being a learner myself. I found that I am teaching them to, to go beyond the maya that, that pervades all of us. But I have been operating from my, my maya of my techniques, my transformation ways, my DNA, my conversation, my learning. It's all, it became out there, but I didn't go inside. I realized whatever I am telling you know, the people ask, asking people in a program with a senior managers asking, when did you take a last major risk? When did you jump into not knowing? I realized one day, I haven't jumped into not knowing myself. I've been too busy selling this stuff that I have not eaten my own dog food. And uh, Somewhere, I am in my own web. So I had to break out of it. So in breaking out of it, I realized in doing this for past 35 years, I did a lot of work out there. 
but I didn't take care of my own family. My children have grown up. My son has his own children. And how well do I know that? How much was I with them as they grew up? How much have I communicated? How much I have actually related to my own spouse in past 40 years that I've been married to? Somewhere, you know, if I try to be a teacher or a coach or a mentor to my own family, it doesn't work. They tell me very clearly, I need a husband. I don't need a teacher or a coach. Thank you very much. Keep those two people who pay you. That was shocking for me. And uh, so for past five years, I feel like I have gone back to the uh, alphabet. You know, I am relearning what I thought I knew because I got in the, what you call to a certain extent, the Maya or the hallucination or the drug called earning money, putting food on the table, getting the name, fame, recognition. In this addiction, I lost myself. So, so I am make, taking baby steps into whatever I thought I taught to a lot of people. Now I'm trying to figure out a way in which I can live them myself one step at a time. And I'm finding the recipe that I have been giving to other people is really hard because I'm not able to practice some of it myself. And some of it is blatantly not useful because I'm not finding much of, uh, you know, effect and results in what I thought. What I thought it worked. You know, so if I had 10, 15, 20% effectiveness in my programs, it is not because what I was saying was great, but because how they listened, how they interpreted and how they lived their life is what made them extraordinary. Not necessarily my teaching not necessarily my coaching. That was the harsh, difficult reality that I was selling snake oil at some level. So that was a difficult pill for me to swallow myself. So now I don't charge. Uh, I don't teach. I am there to have conversations and I share whatever I can share about myself and how, and I'm going you know, I'm back to being a student of Indic wisdom and what can I learn? What can I write? How can I communicate for my own good? So I write a lot more autobiographical reflections and my own uh, quandaries and my own questions for which I have not found answers. That's what I'm exploring and inquiring into. This is such a radical tender. <laughs> So, so grateful and inspiring and also humbling. Um, and we live in a even ever speeding world now. I'm mindful of your time again. Uh, can we have another five to eight minutes and then we can close yeah. that talking? Five to eight minutes we have. Then okay. maybe another person who will come sure. to sure. meet at 10 o'clock. Um, so the yeah. Uh, okay, I think I'll I'll take that uh, I'll take the opportunity to then uh, ask a different question, which could be the closing. And by question. the way, we can have another conversation, and we can always have another one. But I just want you to know. Sure. This. Sure. So then I'll pre I'll I'll take that opportunity. So I'll then uh, ask the question I wanted to ask. Uh, we live in an ever speeding world, you know, with exponential tech disruption. Um, um, and it's not allowing people to uh, create structures for system two, for pit stops, for reflections. Uh, how do you, given all of this, where do you draw your optimism about the world from, if at all you're optimistic? Or let me let me not pose binary, but 
uh, what are the uh, what are the aspects you see in the world which are optimistic to you, and what are the things that you find concerning in the world? Excellent question. What I realized is, what I see in the world is a reflection of my own state of mind. Um, you probably heard of this story when uh, Yudhishthira and the Duryodhana were learning from their teacher. In this particular case, I do not know whether it is Drona or Krupa or some other teacher that they were going to at early period. And uh, there was a question that was given and the both of them said, what do you mean there are so many good people? And uh, then uh, that is what uh, Duryodhana said and and immediately Yudhishthira said, what do you mean there are so many bad people? And the teacher said, what do you think? Duryodhana said, people are actually bad. They are waiting to take advantage of. They may show up as good only because there is the external pressure on them. But if you give it to them, they are wild and, you know, all of that. Yudhishthira said exactly opposite. They are all good people. They are just trying to get an opportunity to take it forward. And uh, he said, how about you go to um, what you call uh, um, the um, biggest city nearby, Hastinapura, Spend 24 hours. Count and see how many of them are good people waiting to be bad. How many of them are bad people waiting to be good? 24 hours is done. Both of them didn't come back. It took another day. Then the teacher went and got these people back. What? You guys have given 24 hours. How come you never came back? He said, Duryodhana said, as you told me, I'm still trying to find one good person who will prove me wrong. I thought as soon as I find, I'll come back. I thought. Dharmaraja said, I have been meeting all these people. They're such wonderful people. I haven't found anybody genuinely bad person. So I'm trying to find whether there is somebody bad person. So the key, I think I look at is whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic cannot be based on what I see out there because I see what I want to see. You know, it's a world is nothing but a mirror. There is a Sankaracharya's uh, poem which says, it, it is Dakshinamurti Stotram, I think. Visvam darpanam drusyamana nagari tulyam nija antargatam. The truth is inside. The whole world look appears as a mirror to what you carry inside. So the key part for me is I can look at the world optimistic or pessimistic based on the state of mind that I am operating from. Now, if I do look at the future as distinct and different from my past, I have to make a choice in this moment. This moment, this moment, this moment, every moment I can choose the world to be different from what it was. If I do that, the world is nothing but optimistic because I have a choice in the matter. I have freedom to make it and it is completely going to be my creation. It is the empty space. I can write anything I want. I can draw anything I want to do. So as a matter of fact, it is full of possibility. Like even Swami Ranganathananda in the Ramakrishna mission said, 
what you call Vedanta is science of human possibility. So the possibility show up when I am willing to step into the future as a new moment in which I have freedom to create what I want to create. But if I am stuck to the past, if I look at the world or if I look at what has already happened, either out there in the world or in my own experience, as bad or wrong, then I have same thing and I'm stuck. We'll set up another time. Absolutely. Such a wonderful flow uh, I've had. Thank you so much. And we'll catch up again. You're right. We'll Thank catch you. up again. Huh? Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.